Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Jacob Wilson, and this is our presentation on common wading birds of Florida. And again, my name is Jacob Wilson. I received my undergraduate degree in mass communications from the University of South Florida. I am currently pursuing my master's degree in global sustainability from the University of South Florida again. I'll be here for quite some time. I'm a Florida native who's passionate about education, the outdoors, and sustainability. And over the summer, I've had the privilege of working with Dr. Catherine Clements at the UF IFAS Extension Office here in Sarasota County. And welcome everyone. I'm Dr. Katherine Clements. I'm the Ecology and Natural Resources Educator here at University of Florida IFAS Extension in Sarasota County. And my Ecology and Natural Resources program provides education for youth and adults. And I assist our community with wildlife education and concerns, native and invasive species, uh, information on the health benefits of nature, and we do in-person eco walks, which are guided tours at our county parks and preserves. I have a background in environmental studies with a bachelor's from State University of New York in Buffalo, and then I spent about 15 years as a naturopathic physician as well before coming back full circle to environmental education about five years ago here at UF IFAS. So if you aren't familiar with extension offices, there are extension offices associated with all 67 counties in the state of Florida and also in all states in our country because they are associated with land grant universities in each of our states. Here in Sarasota, we're a partnership between Sarasota County, the University of Florida and the USDA. And our mission is really to use that university research and resources to address local needs in our community and provide practical education to our residents, professionals, and decision makers. We have programs in all these six core areas. And then we also have uh, programs that you see on the screen right now, the logos. And these are different programs that are offered throughout our six core areas. Up in the upper right hand side of the screen in just a moment, you will see our Florida Master Naturalist logo. And this is a program that I am a lead instructor for here at UF IFAS Extension. And if you want to learn more about our programming um, and our Master Naturalist programs where you can learn more about our environment, please join our website. Alrighty, so to begin, we'd like to define what is a wading bird. I like to think that wading bird is an umbrella term used, that is used to define a group of species of birds that share similar physical characteristics, but all of them vary in different size, shapes, and color. Certain physical characteristics that define a wading bird would include their long and thin legs and toes that assist them while foraging through shallow waters or flowing currents. Another physical characteristic would be their bill. Each wading bird has a unique bill that is often directly related to their foraging techniques and their diet. Some can be long and curved, some can be spooned, and others may be almost dagger-like. The shape of their bill is often directly related to their foraging strategy. Lastly, all wading birds rely on the wetlands for habitat, foraging, and nesting. We have a juvenile white ibis right there on our right side. And to begin, we're gonna address the ibises and the spoonbills. The American white ibis. If you live in Florida, surely you've seen this bird in your suburban neighborhood, park, always walking around in flocks. This bird is almost entirely white. The white ibis is a medium-sized wading bird with a football-shaped body, long reddish pink legs and a bill. This bird also has blue eyes that pop out against its bright orange beak. Their wingtips are colored black and they're best seen during flight. You can see just the tip of it right there. They have a little black at the end of their flight feathers. Juveniles as seen in the previous photo are colored brown and white and they have a very streaky look to them. But the legs and bill remain that reddish pink color. These verbs probe the muddy surface of shallow wetlands while grouping while foraging in groups. This is a wetland bird that is usually found near shallow water where they can forage but in Florida, it is common to spot this wading bird in lawns and parks. 
Here's a photo of a flock of white ibises. This was taken uh, flying over Mayaka River State Park here in Sarasota County. And you can really see in that previous photo there um, the tips of their black wings. And here you can also see a little bit of that black wing tip sticking out from underneath that middle bird. But these are some white ibises right here at our extension office at Twin Lakes Park in Sarasota County. And sometimes they really look like chickens to me the way um, they move when they walk. And here they are also here at Twin Lakes Park by our extension office. And you see they're often found in people's yards and neighborhoods right along the roads. And so all those identifying features that Jacob just mentioned are really the best way to know that you're looking at a white ibis, especially that pinkish orange curved beak. This slide was taken down in Venice. This was actually, I was just driving down the road and there was a flock of ibises in someone's yard and there was an immature or juvenile white ibis. So you see that on the right-hand side, it does have that pinkish orange curved beak. And sometimes the legs are still maturing into that deeper pinkish orange color like this one, but you also see the juvenile feathers that are brown and white. And sometimes when they're a little bit younger, they're really streaky. And in this one, it's starting to get its full on white plumage. So it's got more chunks of brown feathers on its primary wing feathers, but the back of it is almost completely white already. So this one's a teenager about ready to go off to Ibis College. <laughs> All right. So the juvenile white Ibis can look quite similar to the glossy Ibis. This is due to the fact that they have nearly identical shape and size. They both have that football shaped body, long downward curved beak, but a key identifier is going to be that reddish pink beak and the reddish pink legs. As you can tell, the glossy ibis on the right-hand side does not have this. What they do have is, as the name implies, a glossy colored plumage. It's usually some sort of violet or metallic green. So remember, if you're getting these confused, and first off, you probably are not seeing the glossy ibis as frequently in your suburban neighborhoods as you would the white ibis. But if you do see them together in groups, be sure to keep a lookout for this reddish pink bill. It's a key identifier that you're looking at a juvenile white ibis. The glossy ibis, slightly larger than a cattle egret, being of medium size with a long neck, long legs, and a long curved bill. Stocky body type, again, almost identical to that of the white ibis. Its habitat includes nearly all wetland areas with shallow water. When on land, the glossy ibis will pursue insects and grain, but when in the wetlands, they put their long bill to good use, probing through mud and water to consume an array of creatures that includes worms, crickets, leeches, beetles, fish, crabs, frogs, and more. They commonly forage in freshwater marshes, but when on dry land, they pick and extract their food. When in wet soil, this bird swings its bill back and forth through the mud and shallow water to scan for its prey. The roseate spoonbill is always a pleasure to see. It's an incredible bird with a few very unique characteristics that make them stand out from the rest. It has that vibrant pink coloration, red eyes, and a large spoon-shaped bill, which we'll get more into soon. It's, a, it's really, it's an incredible feature. The juveniles are a lighter pink and have a full feathered head while the adults are nearly bald on the head. Their habitat includes bays, forested swamps, and mangroves that near the water's edge, now what makes the bill so unique, aside from its shape, is tactile senses that the roseate spoonbill uses while foraging. What this means is their bill has pits near the end of its bill that are packed with cell receptors. These receptors are so sensitive to the touch that when the spoonbill is foraging for its food, it does not even have to use its eyes. They will sweep their spoon-shaped bill through the water while partially opened and hunting for crustaceans. And once their tactile receptors detect the slightest touch, it immediately snaps shut on its prey. So that pink plumage is developed through the consumption of a species of brine shrimp that's called Artemia salina. And this brine shrimp actually consumes a carotenoid pigment. And this carotenoid pigment is typically found in plants, but it can be synthesized into a microalgae, which is then consumed by the brine shrimp. And the roseate spoonbill consumes the brine shrimp, giving it that pink coloration through the carotenoid pigment. 
Some more fun facts about roseate spoonbills. If you'd like to find them, they nest near red and black mangroves. And sometimes spoonbills and wood storks nest together. Later on in this presentation, we'll get into wood storks because similar to the roseate spoonbill, they have those tactile receptors in their bill that gives them a similar foraging tactic. Spoonbills are not born with this trademark spoon-shaped bill. When in fact, a chick is about nine days old, the bill begins to flatten. And after 30 days, the bill becomes full size. It's a fast process. During the 1900s, there was the plume trade. And as you can tell, the feathers in the roseate spoonbill could be used as quite fancy decor. When they were dressing in big hats, they would overhunt this species, sadly, like taking away its plumage and using it for attire, hats, decoration. And this led to overhunting and loss of its natural habitat. But through strong preservation efforts, the spoonbill now has a thriving population that is spreading across the coastal southeast. Here's the picture of roseate spoonbills on Rookery Island, which is out in Sarasota Bay. So you can see some mangroves there and they are, uh, they are flocking to that island as well as uh, nesting in those mangroves on that island. Those Rookery Islands are just great places for them. They're very safe. There's not a lot of uh, prey or sorry, predator animals that are gonna come out and get onto those Rookery Islands. So it's a wonderful safe place for the birds to either rest or actually to nest and hatch their young. This is also that same Rookery Island, just a different shot. We've got lots of egrets. Um, there as well as the spoonbills down in the front of the photo. This is a roseate spoonbill out at Big Lake at Oscar Shears State Park. Uh, so this was back in April 2020 and it was a pretty cloudy day but there were a bunch of wading birds in the lake and the spoonbill was flying in and we have a couple of photos that show it landing I believe is the next photo and we've got a tricolored heron behind it. And then in the next photo, uh, there's that spoonbill. It's doing its foraging technique. It's got a couple ducks behind it and that tricolored heron in front of it now. All right, onto our bitterns, the least in American bitterns. They're in the same family and order as herons and egrets. The least bittern is a very small wading bird with a sharp, short, dagger-like bill long legs, long toes, and a hunched over look that's caused by its long neck that they draw in towards their body. These birds have a blackish brown color on top and lighter colors on the bottom. If seen up close, the males have two white stripes going down the back, which are quite prominent and can be used as a key identifier. Females and juveniles tend to be more brown and buff in body type. Their feathers are neatly edged, and if seen from above, they appear to be almost scaly. Typically, this bird's hunting style consists of standing or hanging motionless from reeds that near the water's edge, and they quickly strike at their prey with that dagger-like bill. Their diet mainly includes small fish, such as sunfish, minnows, perches. Smaller crustaceans and land animals are also consumed, such as snakes, frogs, mice, and salamanders. The least bittern forages alone with efficient movements. They're quick on their feet, and their bodies can compress in order to swiftly move through the dense vegetation. This waiting bird remains very well hidden. All right, and this could be commonly confused because both of these birds have those necks they draw into their body. On the left, we have the green heron, and on the right, we have the least bittern. They share similarities in sh size, shape, color, and posture, and it's understandable if you confuse the both of them. But to keep in mind, on the right side, the least bittern is smaller than the green heron. The face and neck of the least bittern is a yellow beige, while the green herons is a chestnut brown. And the wings of the least bittern have tan patches, while the green heron has dark wings and a bluish green backside. Both of these birds have that similar dagger-like bill and that S-shaped neck that they draw in towards their body. I was happy to find both of these photos because it shows them with their neck extended. And you can see their posture and their movements, uh, they're very similar. The American bittern is a medium-sized heron with a stocky build, short legs, and a much thicker neck than most herons, which to me makes this bird very identifiable. And they have a long bill that's sharply pointed, and they have clear streaks that are mostly brown, buff, and white. 
the streaks are especially clear down the neck. As you can see in this photo, streaks going right down the neck there, very prominent. As um, uh, in common with the other least bittern, this bird remains well hidden amongst vegetation where it stands perfectly still with its bill facing upwards. It is more likely one will hear this bird before seeing it due to its unique mating call that sounds like loud gulps. Due to the brown and white streaks of its coloration, standing motionless and pointing its bill upwards, this bird is able to blend completely into the background, which is a part of their foraging technique. While standing still in camouflage, they wait for their prey to approach, and as is in common with the least bittern, this is typically done alone. It's uncommon for this bird to be found out in the open. It's much more common to be found in shallow freshwater marshes or amongst vegetation. This is a photo or a couple photos of an American bittern at Gain, up in Gainesville. This was at the Sweetwater Wetlands Park, which is a beautiful place if you are ever up in Gainesville to travel and to actually see some of these wonderful wading birds. And as Jacob mentioned, American bitterns are pretty uncommon to see. They, they hunt alone, they are um, well camouflaged, they're sort of secretive. But Jacob and I, although we did not get a picture, actually saw one at Red Bug Slough here in Sarasota County a few weeks ago. So they're around, but you really have to use your um, all of your nature senses to be able to spot one. <laughs> Okay, pelicans. The white pelican is not exactly a wading bird, but this aquatic bird is worth diving into. <laughs> this is one of the largest flying birds here in North America, and one can easily spot this bird steadily soaring along the coast, flapping their broad wings. This water bird has a huge pouch-shaped bill, a long neck, thick body, short legs, and a small square tail. One unique detail about this bird is they develop a this lump, as you can slightly see in this photo right here, both the male and female during breeding season. This bird is white with black wing feathers that are only visible when spread. Underneath right here, you're able to see. The bills and legs are a yellowish orange. Unlike the brown pelican, this bird does not plunge dive. They feed from the water surface and scoop fish from the ocean by dipping their large beaks into the water. This species of pelican will even group up with other pelicans to herd fish in a shallow water for an easy forage. A true snowbird. The white pelican is a winter visitor to Florida. Unlike the brown pelican who's a year round resident, the white pelican arrives in the fall and leaves in the spring. They, might, they migrate back up north for breeding season between April and June. The brown pelican you can commonly see frequenting beaches and other very populated areas. While on the other hand, the white pelican much prefers less traveled habitats, such as estuaries, lakes, and mangrove islands. Certain nearby areas where you may be able to find white pelicans during their winter season would include Mayaka River State Park, Sarasota Bay, Jim Neville Marine Preserve, and Titty Island in Sarasota Bay. The white and brown pelican, as you can tell, they're easy to separate from one another. Their physical characteristics are quite different, as are their habitats. The brown pelican prefers the immediate coast over beaches, salt bays, and the ocean, and they do that incredible plunge dive from up to 60 feet in the air to go hunt for its prey underwater. The white pelican has a habitat farther inland, like lakes, marshes, and salt bays. They breed along coastal islands in the winter, breeds along coastal islands along the coast. Storks. The wood stork is a stout-bodied wading bird that sits atop long black legs. They have a long neck and a downward curved bill. The head does not have fe feathers and has a scaly appearance. The rest of the wood stork is white aside from their tail and flight feathers. This bird stands over three feet tall and soars on thermals with its neck and legs stretched out. I also thought it was important to identify what thermals are just in case anybody didn't know. Thermals is a rising column of air warm air that forms from an uneven heating of air near the ground. The rising air helps push the bird up making for an easier, more energy efficient flight. As we mentioned earlier in the presentation, the wood stork has those tactile receptors in its bill, which is very similar to the rosette spoon bill. And this allows them to use a special foraging technique called tactolocation, where it can scan the shallow water with its partially open bill and quickly snap it shut when touched by its prey. On average, the wood stork can snap its bill shut on its prey at a 25 millisecond reflex, 
This is the fastest reflex action known of any vertebrate. There's a great photo of a wood stork right here. I think to me, they have an almost prehistoric looking uh, face and bill to them, a, a really an amazing bird. The wood stork was actually placed on the endangered species list in 1984. And in 2014, it was moved from endangered to threatened. Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary has supported approximately 75,000 nests since 1958, making this the most productive colony in the entire nation. Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary is located 30 minutes east of Naples and is home to a wide variety of wading birds. Definitely worth a drive. And I know during the presentation, it's quite easy to say you can separate these birds, but sometimes when you're out there and if you're seeing a bunch of wading birds, it's important to know these little details. On the left, we have the wood stork. You can see those black flight feathers all underneath as in the white ibis, which of course is much smaller. We just have those wing tips are going to be black. And the great egret, more similar to size as the wood stork, is going to be completely white if you see these flying. The limpkins were in the same order as the sandhill crane. The limpkin is a large heron-sized wading bird that has a rich brown coloration with a white speckled pattern through the neck, back, and wings. The body is large and heavy, the neck and legs are long, and the bill is thicker than most with a slight downward curve. This tropical wetland bird actually specializes in hunting apple snails during both the day and night. The bill of this bird is so uniquely shaped that it makes for a very efficient forage of apple snails. It's able to just curve directly into the shell. When the, bird, when the bill is closed, it has a gap just before the tip and is slightly curved to the right, making it the perfect tool to pick a snail right out of its shell. These birds can be commonly found in both swamp and marsh freshwater habitats, anywhere where apple snails are present. And this is a photo from Mayaka River State Park. This is actually, if you've, if you've been there and you've driven along the park road, this photo, I was standing right on the edge of the park road. And this is during wet season where the river has flooded over its banks. And actually, sometimes the river floods right over the road and Mayaka has to close the road partially or completely. Uh, so you can see that the rivers come all the way up to the road and right there in the middle are a couple limpkins. And in the next slide, we have a closer up photo of those two limpkins. And at the bottom, right there where Jacob is circling with his arrow, you see an invasive apple snail. So our, um, we have native apple snails here in Florida that were historically the diet of the limpkin, but we now have invasive apple snails, which are quite larger. That one's really large, so I know it's the invasive one. And the limpkin population has seemed to really rebound because they have more food and also a larger food as well. Unfortunately though, for our native apple snails, this invasive snail competes with them. It competes for resources as well as it lays more eggs than our native snail. It also will actually eat our native snail as well because it's so much larger. So perhaps good for the limpkin, but not necessarily good for our environment that we now have these invasive apple snails there. But such a great picture of those two limpkins. It looks like they're just eyeballing that snail getting ready to find a meal. And here is a limpkin flying. This is also at Mayaka River. You can see in the back um, left-hand corner there, that's actually the bridge on the park road where a lot of people stop to look for alligators. And we were actually kayaking and this limpkin took flight. So I have just a couple pictures following um, the limpkin flying across the river. Beautiful, beautiful shots that I really enjoyed being able to take. Okay, and the next bird is going to be the Anhinga. This is technically a diving bird, but is commonly found in the same or similar habitats as other wading birds. The Anhinga is a large and rather slim and slender bird that has a fan-like tail, as you can see right here. And this separates them from most wading birds. It's a tail that is that of a turkey's almost. It's just a big fan. The neck is S-shaped and the bill is sharp and pointed. When in flight, this bird looks like a cross. Wings will be flat out and the neck and tail pointing straight out. Adult males are black with silver and white streaks across the back and wing feathers. 
The adult females and juveniles have a tan head, neck, and chest. The bill and legs are a yellow-orange. When these birds swim, they keep their bodies mostly submerged while utilizing their long S-shaped neck and holding it partially out of the water and stabbing fish with its bill. And we have a photo in the next couple slides that will show that to you. And that's really, you'll always see anhingas. Now, next time you look at a big freshwater lake, you'll find an anhinga in there swimming around. Uh, these birds do not have waterproof feathers. This actually helps them slowly submerge into the water to secretly stalk fish. This also makes them easy to spot when they hang at the edge of shallow lakes and ponds, spreading their wings in order to dry out. On the left, we have that female anhinga, and on the right, we have the male. These are easy to separate. The male, as you can tell, is completely black, and the female, and juveniles as well, will have this tan chest and long S-shaped neck, but just completely tan. There we go, right on the left. Yeah, so there's um, a photo of an anhinga swimming and just sticking out a little bit of its neck before it is about to die for fish. And then on the right, you see a female anhinga. Once again, notice that brownish uh, neck and a little bit on the chest. And the females will have the white silvery marks on their um, back and wing feathers as well but they will have that brown neck, whereas the juveniles, depending on how old they are, may not have fully developed the white feathers on their back and wings, but will have that brown neck and chest. So that's how to tell the juveniles from the females from the males. In the next slide, we have a female who, had, who is currently rearing her nestlings there. So um, those are baby birds that maybe only a mom and dad could love. They're not the prettiest of birds when they're young. Um, these are actually probably adolescent birds. They aren't really young, but this was taken at the Venice Area Audubon Rookery. So that's a wonderful place to go, especially in the springtime. This photo was taken in April, I believe. And so the birds were a little bit older than just um, hatchlings, uh, but they aren't quite ready to fledge out of the nest yet. So you see that beautiful female um, and then some two, uh, two birds, two young birds in the middle there. And all the way over to the right, you can also see another nest. Um, it's better hidden, but there's a female and a couple of babies in that nest as well. Here's just another view of that. The babies are getting hungry and stretching their necks out and calling for some food in that one. And although this is not a bird we're talking about in this presentation, it's definitely not an anhinga, but I just included this photo because this is also from that same day at Venice Area Audubon Society. These are a couple great egrets and their young um, bird right there. And I just thought this was such an interesting photo because what you're seeing is the two parents and the one parent on the left is actually lifting up the wing of its young um, baby bird there and you can actually almost see the bones because the sun is behind shining through the wings. So I just, it looks like a chicken wing almost. So I just thought that was a pretty cool picture to include. All right, and another diving bird. Um, this is going to be the cormorants. And again, these are commonly found against, amongst other wading birds. The double crested cormorant, if you ever go out on the boat or a fisherman, I'm sure you've seen many of these out on the water. This is a matte black water bird with an orange yellow face skin, long tail, kinked neck, and a small head. The bill has a strong hook and is typically the length of the bird's head. During breeding season, as you can see in this photo, oh, the, well, the eyeball, as you can see as well, the adult develops a double crest of black or white feathers on its back. Juveniles are all around browner and paler on the neck and chest. These birds float very low on the water's surface and are excellent divers. Between this and their hooked bell, they are well adapted for catching fish. You can find these birds amongst big bodies of water with heavy fish life. They can also be found spreading their wings while perched in high areas near the water's edge, such as rocks, wires, and at the tops of dead trees. These birds have less preen oil than most birds, which does not allow them to shed waters effectively. Again, this can be an advantage for the underwater hunter. 
As these are both water birds and you can find them in similar spots, I just wanted to point out some key differences between the anhinga and the double-crested cormorant, especially in regards to their bill shape. On the left, the anhinga has that dagger-like bill. And on the right, it's the, that hook-shaped bill. And there's a great photo as well. You can really see those beautiful blue eyes in the cormorant. And yep, so they use that. The anhinga uses their sharp bill to spear prey out of the water while the cormorant uses their hooked bill to snag prey from the water. And this is a double crested cormorant photo from Big Lake and Oscar Shearer State Park. Once again, not the greatest lighting, but it's just a good photo to show the body shape. Uh, the double crested cormorant are a little bit uh, squatter and stockier than our anhingas are. Our anhingas are a little bit more elongated, almost a little bit more elegant in my mind. And then in the next few photos, we have some pictures of a double crested cormorant that I took when I was out on a boat in Sarasota Bay. And these were just really fun photos to take. Cormorants uh, are usually found in freshwater, but are happy to be in saltwater as well, like we see here in the bay. And this cormorant was just swimming around the boat and uh, looking for fish and really entertaining us. And it's really beautiful because as the bird is diving here, you can see the detail of its feathers. And in the next photo, I believe it's popping up and you really get to see that blue eye and that hook beak. And then in the final photo, we really see once again, some of that amazing detail on its feathers and how you can almost see the water being shed or rolling off of it as it takes a dive underwater to look for food. And then we wanted to talk to, about where you can find birds, especially if you're here in Sarasota County. So you may be watching this from somewhere else, but if you're here with us in Sarasota County, there's a lot of amazing birding hotspots. In fact, visitsarasota.com has an article on bird watching 101 here in Sarasota County. So that's a great thing to look up. Uh, but I listed a few here. These are all also listed on that visitsarasota.com website. But Celery Fields is one of the best places, especially if you wanna see one of these wading birds or freshwater birds because there have been 246 species of birds documented to have visited celery fields. There are also two wonderful boardwalks at celery fields that take you out onto uh, the stormwater ponds, which are just wonderful, um, wonderful examples of what looks like native wetlands. Uh, they have been replanted with some native species and then have really attracted many species of birds to that area. And we have a little video here that is actually from one of the boardwalks. And this is a limpkin. I want you to hear the sound of the limpkin, which is very haunting. <laughs> Right. So you can't help but once you've heard a limpkin, you will know it if you hear them again. And very often you will hear them before you see the one. But this one was just perching right out there and showing off for us. We had a class of master naturalists out there at the celery fields. Also at the celery fields um, in that same location is the Sarasota Audubon Society. And through most of the year, especially during season, they will have uh, bird volunteers out on the boardwalks that will help you identify birds. They often will have a scope set up so you can look at the birds even closer. They'll have a list of birds that have already been seen that day. So really, if you're interested in bird birding, this is a great place to go. Uh, I have already mentioned the Venice Area Audubon Rookery. That is a little further south in Sarasota County in Venice. And once again, that's a rookery island in a small um, pond, so surrounded by water, but has tons of nesting birds during nesting season, but still plenty of wading birds there even outside of nesting season. And then other great places are our state and county parks like Mayaka River State Park, Redbug Slough, 
Arlington Park is a city park in a neighborhood here, but they have some ponds as well where you can sometimes see some of these wading birds that we talked about. Oscar Shearer State Park uh, is a great place for both scrub jays as well as if you walk out to Big Lake, you might see some of these birds. And then there's a few other places listed there as well. <clears throat> there are also 17 locations along the Great Florida Birding and Wildlife Trail here in Sarasota County. So those are wonderful places to go as well. Next. <laughs> so here's a wider picture of that Rookery Island out in Sarasota Bay. So even if you're out on a boat, you will often get a chance to see many of the birds that we have just talked about. And then just a reminder, here's where our local Audubon societies are in Sarasota County. We have both the Sarasota Audubon Society out at the Celery Fields on Center Road in Sarasota, and then the Venice Area Audubon Society, which is down on Taniami Trail behind the large county building in Venice. All right, and these are some sources that I was able to use in order to put together this presentation. All About Birds is an excellent website if you're looking to learn more about birds, those different physical traits that you, when you're going out to identify them, their behavior, range, habitat, diet, really excellent source if you're looking to learn more about a certain species. And below is some more information if you're interested in that, um, the carotenoid pigment that is consumed by the roseate spoonbill and some other good sources that we use to put together this presentation. All right, thank you so much for joining us, everybody. It was a pleasure to be able to host this presentation. I was really looking forward to it. If you have any further questions, please feel free to reach out to Dr. Catherine Clements. Her email is listed below. And for anybody who's watching on YouTube, please be sure to fill out that survey. It is listed in the information box right below the video. Thank you guys for joining us today.